Dr. Amita Singh completed her infectious disease specialty training in 1996 before going on to complete a Master's of Science in Epidemiology at Harvard University in 2002. She was the Provincial Consultant for Sexually Transmitted and Bloodborne Infections in Alberta, Canada for 10 years and has been the Medical Director of the STD Centre in the Capital Health Region since 1998. Hello, Dr. Singh. How are you doing today? Good, thank you. Great. Um, so I'd like to first thank you very much for agreeing to appear on our MediViews.com webcast today. Um, You're welcome. And as you know, uh, the topic of our discussion today will be HIV. Um, now, as all of you know, um, humans can be infected by a whole variety of different viruses. And I guess my first question to you, Dr. Singh, would be um, sort of what unique characteristics of HIV make it so dangerous and as yet uh, uncurable? Yes, th um, that's a really good question. Um, HIV is what's called an RNA tumor. It's a retrovirus, mm -hmm. and retroviruses used to be called RNA tumor viruses because many RNA tumor viruses cause tumors or cancers, um, usually in animals, not so much in humans. Mm -hmm. um, but HIV is quite unique um, in many ways. Um, the HIV virus itself. Um, does attach itself to human cells, to the surface of certain types of human cells, um, particularly um, the, the uh, T lymphocyte or T helper cells um, mm -hmm. in the body. And uh, after it attaches to the cells, it then is quite sneaky and it in actually incorporates itself into the um, genetic material of the human host cell mm -hmm. so that um, it becomes a part of that cell and uh, it can then damage it and destroy it, um, but also it can stay silent or latent there for long periods and then something will trigger it to start multiplying um, rapidly, at which point it starts to kill off the cells. Um, the virus is also quite clever because it can um, uh, mutate or change itself very quickly so that as soon as the uh, body's immune system is, thinks it's figuring out how to attack it and destroy it, the virus quickly changes and so it actually evades the body's responses to killing it off. Um, and so that's, you know, those are some of the things that make it quite uh, dangerous. Okay, so that, um, uh, just to clarify, I think it was an important point, the, the, the types of cells um, in the human body which are actually um, affected uh, when someone is infected with HIV are um, the immune cells, basically the lymphocytes. That's right. Okay. And there are certain types of um, immune cells called the CD4 cells um, that are particularly targeted by the HIV virus. Okay, great. Um, now, uh, maybe just to clarify a little bit of a confusion that some people may have about um, the specific issue, um, what's the difference between um, HIV and AIDS? Yes, that's a good question. So HIV is the virus um, that can cause infection with HIV, mm -hmm. um, but uh, AIDS is the stage of HIV um, where that occurs after HIV has been in the body for a long period of time. Typically, um, it's on an average of about 10 years, but can be as short as a few months or as long as 30 years before AIDS develops. Okay. Um, and at that point, many of the CD4 cells have been destroyed and the immune system is very weakened. Okay. And once the person's into that stage, um, then they're at risk of developing certain types of infections. Probably one of the most well-known is a type of pneumonia called pneumocystis pneumonia. Um, and also certain types of cancers, um, including Kaposi's sarcoma, and even, for example, cervical cancer mm -hmm. is considered to be an AIDS-defining illness. Okay. Very interesting. So basically, AIDS um, sort of is, is uh, part of the progression of an HIV infection. That's right. And of course, in the later stages. Okay. Now, um, how common or, or how prevalent uh, is uh, the HIV virus in our society today? So we don't know for sure um, how many people are truly infected with HIV in Canada. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason for that, obviously, is that not everyone has had an HIV test done. But the best guess um, is that about 58,000 people in Canada are infected with HIV. Okay. And that up to about 4,500 new people are infected each year in the country. Okay. Oh, wow. Uh, those are some uh, still surprisingly high figures. Yes. <laughs> now, uh, what are the main ways in which the HIV virus um, is transmitted from person to person? 
Right. So HIV can be transmitted um, in several different ways. Uh, probably the most well-known is through the sharing of blood or body fluids. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously um, before we used to routinely test blood um, being transfused um, into people, uh, that was a, a good way for HIV to be passed on and through blood or blood products. Mm -hmm. um, but in Canada today, all blood is um, screened for HIV before transfusion. Mm -hmm. Um, and also through the sharing of blood by sharing of needles um, used for inje uh, injecting drugs mm -hmm. um, or needle equipment. So for example, the spoons that are used to heat drugs or the water that is used to mix drugs with. Mm -hmm. If that is shared between two individuals, then um, the HIV virus could be passed on that way. The other um, very good way for HIV to be passed on is through sexual transmission. Mm -hmm. um, and so all, um, uh, certainly anal um, sex is associated with the highest risk of transmission, okay. um, followed by vaginal sex. Um, and even oral sex has a very low chance of passing on the HIV virus. Okay. So the last uh, most important uh, way um, that HIV can be passed on is of course from mother to child. If a pregnant woman is infected with HIV mm -hmm. and she doesn't receive any treatment uh, during the pregnancy, then she can certainly pass on HIV as well to her baby. Okay. Um, and now what about sort of more um, casual contact such as um, like hugging or, or maybe sharing a drinking glass with someone who is HIV infected? Um, can you actually acquire the virus in this manner? Yeah, so the virus is fortunately not very sturdy, okay. um, so that, for example, if you were to have um, a syringe lying around with, um, which had HIV positive blood in it, if it were to stay there for even a few hours, um, the virus will die very quickly. Okay. Um, so it's not a very hardy or tough virus that way, and um, certainly it cannot be passed on by hugging or sharing of uh, utensils or the same drinking cups. Um, you really have to have sharing of blood or body fluids okay. um, so that, you know, even kissing, deep kissing, unless there's sharing of blood somehow, mm -hmm. um, would not result in HIV being passed on. Okay. And um, I guess so now to just expand on this point a little more because it is um, one of the major uh, roots of HIV transmission and I think you already briefly mentioned that uh, um, um, do certain um, sort of sexual uh, acts or activities pose a greater risk for HIV transmission than, than others? Yes, they do. So um, certainly anal sex um, poses the greatest risk for sexual transmission of HIV. Okay. And particularly for the person who is on the bottom or the receiving end, mm -hmm. um, if uh, they are on the bottom or receiving end of anal sex, then they are at highest risk of acquiring HIV if they're exposed to it. Okay. Um, for the person who's on top, mm -hmm. um, there's a lesser risk, but certainly that person is also at risk. Okay. And similarly, and, and that is followed then, um, the next highest risk is for vaginal sex. Okay. And oral sex is not a very efficient way to pass on HIV, but certainly mm -hmm. um, transmission can occur uh, through oral sex as well. Okay. Great. Um, and so I guess now addressing the one of the other major routes of transmission, which is um, IV drug use. Yes. Um, what I was just curious uh, to ask you about is whether programs such as um, uh, like needle exchanges or safe injection sites, have they uh, shown, been shown to have a positive impact mm -hmm. on uh, dealing with HIV transmission? Yeah, so um, needle exchange programs have been around for many years now um, and in many different countries mm -hmm. and there have been a number of different reports including um, a, a well no report put out by the World Health Organization in about 2004, mm -hmm. which concluded, you know, that there is overwhelming evidence to show that needle exchange programs that are well established in many countries mm -hmm. um, can reduce the risk of HIV and okay. have been shown to reduce HIV transmission mm -hmm. and also to reduce HIV prevalence um, in the communities where they have been implemented. Mm -hmm. um, the safe injection sites have obviously been around for a lot less um, time but um, there is evidence to suggest that providing a safe environment for people to inject where they're less likely to share needles um, can definitely um, reduce as well HIV transmission that way. Okay, and would you say that um, sort of maybe North America right now are 
do most major cities have um, safe injection sites or do sort of... Is no, it just in fact, on um, in North America, mm -hmm. the safe injection site in, Va in Vancouver is the only existing site. And of course, that remains a pilot mm -hmm. um, while it remains under review uh, by the federal government. So another th um, thing that I've uh, often wondered about is, is it possible for an HIV positive um, individual to carry on a sexual relationship with someone um, who is not HIV positive um, without actually transmitting the disease? Or? Yes, absolutely. Um, so, you know, the virus, as I say, is actually quite inefficient um, in terms of being transmitted. Um, so we have a number of couples who are where one partner is HIV positive and the other person is negative. And um, the advice that we usually provide to them mm -hmm. is that uh, they can engage in sexual activity as long as they're using condoms. Okay. So condoms are very effective in reducing the risk of HIV transmission. Okay. But of course, those condoms also need to be used for oral sex. Okay. And um, you know, depending on which partner is positive, um, if, for example, the woman is the is the positive partner then not engaging in sexual activity while the woman is menstruating so mm. that there's less risk of sharing blood mm. um, and engaging in less risky sexual practices as well. Mm. So for example, practices where there would be tearing or disruption of the mucosal membranes in the genital area. Okay, great. And so I guess you've also uh, briefly touched on um, some of these points as well, but um, sort of just to summarize, um, what are some of the most effective um, ways in which uh, someone can prevent um, or avoid acquiring an HIV infection? So I think there are a number of things that can be done. So obviously um, anything um, that will promote safer sexual behavior, um, such as uh, for adolescents in particular, I think that it's important to mention that delaying the onset of sexual activity, so delaying how old you are before you first engage in sexual activity, mm -hmm. um, reducing your number of sexual partners, being aware of how HIV can be passed on, mm -hmm. and uh, last but not least, the use of condoms for all sexual practices mm -hmm. um, is very important. For individuals who use um, injection drugs, even injectable steroids, for example, then avoiding the use of uh, share the sh avoiding the sharing of needles or equipment mm -hmm. used to inject those drugs is very important as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I think um, you know another important point is um, to be screened regularly mm -hmm. for sexually transmitted infections um, as well as HIV, uh, because having one sexually transmitted infection. Um, puts you at risk of acquiring HIV if you're then exposed to it. Okay. So that if you um, treat that sexually transmitted infection, you have already reduced your risk already. Okay. And um, one of the things you know that people might want to consider is before engaging in new sexual relationships, mm -hmm. is to go get tested mm -hmm. and make sure that both partners are okay mm -hmm. um, before uh, continuing with the sexual relationship. Sure, yeah, that definitely uh, seems like a reasonable um, yeah. idea. Now, um, is it possible for an HIV positive um, female to get pregnant um, and not pass along the virus to her child? Yes, it certainly is. So if we were to do nothing um, with an HIV positive pregnant woman, mm -hmm. the chances of her passing HIV onto the baby is about 25%. Okay. With the treatment that we have available to us today, uh, we can reduce that risk to well under 1%. So it's oh, pretty wow. incredible. Uh, we can't say the same, for example, for hepatitis B mm -hmm. or syphilis. Um, but for HIV, we have such good treatments and options available to us mm -hmm. that if the mother is able to take um, HIV medications from about the third month of pregnancy mm -hmm. until she delivers, mm -hmm. and then the baby takes some medications for about six weeks after birth, the chances of that baby acquiring HIV are well under 1%. Okay, wow. Um, so that's uh, definitely good to know. And, um, Sort of, I guess the main uh, strategies then for a woman who's pregnant is just to uh, have proper um, uh, drug regimens and, and for modeling. sure, you know the most important thing is to get hooked up to see an HIV specialist mm -hmm. um, from as, as early as possible in the pregnancy. Okay. But it is possible to intervene or to reduce the risk of transmission at any point until the time of delivery. Okay. So you know at any stage where um, an HIV specialist can be brought in to 
um, help out with the management, um, mm -hmm. and uh, that that's very important. Okay, um, so now shifting gears here a little bit. Um, what sort of symptoms um, do some uh, does someone that is HIV positive uh, experience as, as a result of their infection? Right, so um, a few people, well actually about two-thirds of people shortly after they become infected with HIV will feel ill for a short period of time and usually how that will present is with fever, mm -hmm. sore throat, sometimes with a bit of rash, sometimes with swollen lymph glands. Now what I'm describing to you might sound like a number of other very common viral infections and that's uh, unfortunately the case. It can look like any number of viral infections including for example uh, mono mm -hmm. or Epstein-Barr virus infections can present exactly the same way and the only way it would be considered or thought about is if the person appreciated that they might have been at risk for HIV and acquired it mm -hmm. and then to go on and get tested at that point. So that's called an acute seroconversion illness, but most okay. people, it is so minor, they don't notice it and it passes. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, then for a period of time, which could be as long as eight to 10 years, most people will experience nothing at all. So they'll feel perfectly well. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately though, during that time, they're still carrying the virus and they could pass it on, mm -hmm. as well as the virus is continuing to damage um, the body's immune system. Okay. And then eight to ten years down the road, um, if they're not on treatment, then they will go on to develop AIDS or AIDS-defining illnesses, so certain types of infections or cancers um, mm -hmm. that can then make them very sick. Okay. And so um, I guess because of the fact that the immune system is um, so compromised um, with this infection, um, are there any sort of um, like specific or, or characteristic like long-term complications um, of uh, an HIV infection? Like you, you, you mentioned uh, Carposi sarcoma and, and some of these things. Um, are there any others? Uh, oh sure, there, there are, there's a whole long list of different types of infections um, caused by various bacteria, different viruses. Um, so there are, and depending on which one it is and which part of the body they're affecting, mm -hmm. um, it can cause different symptoms. So everything, rate, rate, you know, ranging from um, lesions or tumors in the brain to other body parts to fevers, weight loss. Mm -hmm. So it's a very wide range of things that can happen once you develop an AIDS-defining illness. Okay, great. So um, now I guess the next uh, logical question would be where can someone go to get an HIV test? Yeah, <laughs> so um, HIV testing is readily available in Canada, um, either through your own doctor or most uh, STD clinics um, offer testing. Um, certainly in Alberta and in many other provinces as well, um, it is um, always possible to obtain completely confidential testing. Mm -hmm. And in some places, it is also possible to obtain anonymous testing. Okay. Um, now, depending on which province or territory that you're in, the rules will be different. So, for example, in Alberta, if you do have anonymous testing, mm -hmm. um, if you're negative, there will be no reason to ever report that test having been done. But if you are positive, then under law, mm -hmm. the Public Health Act in Alberta, um, we are required to report that individual as being HIV positive to public health authorities. Okay. Okay. Now, for someone who has been diagnosed um, as being HIV positive, um, currently, what are the uh, sort of first-line drugs used um, in the management of this disease? Yes, yes. No, that's a good question. So, you know, the number of drugs that we have currently has been rising, you know, almost exponentially since they were first introduced in 1996 or so. Mm -hmm. um, but currently, there are six different classes of drugs used to treat HIV infection. Okay. Uh, but most of the time when we are starting to treat somebody uh, for HIV infection, we'll typically use three different drugs mm -hmm. from two different classes of the HIV drugs that we have available to us. Okay. Um, fortunately, because we have so many options now, um, we can always find um, a combination that most people will be able to tolerate or take mm -hmm. because all of these drugs, as with many other drugs, do have a number of different side effects. Um, but as I say, we can virtually always find a combination that people can take and tolerate. Mm -hmm. And um, the really great thing about uh, the treatment for HIV is that it has really changed HIV from being a death sentence mm -hmm. into what we call a chronic manageable disease. So now. 
you know, we could almost approach this as being some uh, how we would treat somebody with diabetes. Yes, you do need to take certain precautions. You need to do make certain lifestyle changes. Uh, but as long as you take the medications and mm -hmm. we are able to treat you early on and you stick with the treatment, then most people would do very well. Okay, great. So, um, I mean, I was going to ask you how, how effective these drugs are, but, but basically um, uh, what you're saying is that um, is that people can lead a relatively uh, normal life, but obviously keeping in mind that they need to take uh, more precautions, they need to take their medications. And, That's right, and, and they, they need to have regular follow-up. And I guess the other thing is that, you know, that they need to go on to treatment uh, probably sooner rather than later on in the course of their illness. So it becomes a lot more difficult to treat if we start to treat only once you've developed AIDS, mm -hmm. when the in infection is very advanced, mm -hmm. then often it can be very difficult to reverse that situation. Okay. It's not impossible though, mm -hmm. and um, you know, I've certainly seen some very um, impressive recoveries. What will happen is the immune system will actually recover or repair itself mm -hmm. um, with treatment, as long as we're able to get it um, at a point where the body is still able to do that. Okay. Perfect. Um, so now, um, my final question to you, uh, Dr. Singh, would be either for someone who is um, HIV positive or, or for someone even who has a loved one um, who has been diagnosed as being HIV positive, um, what are some sort of current sources of, of reliable and uh, accurate information that they can turn to um, for information about this disease? Mm -hmm. So one of the, uh, probably the best way for people who do have access to the internet mm -hmm. um, is to go to some of the more reputable websites um, that provide reliable um, information because I think um, there's a lot of misinformation out there on the web and um, people, you know, often feel that if um, it's out there on the web that uh, it must be correct. Mm -hmm. um, but some of the more reputable websites include um, the Public Health Agency of Canada, mm -hmm. uh, the Canadian um, AIDS Society um, website, and the Canadian um, AIDS Treatment Information Exchange um, website. Okay. Um, some provinces and territories as well also have toll-free um, STD HIV information line. For example, um, in Alberta, the provincial toll-free STD HIV information line is 1-800-772-2437. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that information, that line has recorded information that's available 24 hours a day. Okay. And during business hours, mm -hmm. um, the person can actually speak to a nurse to mm -hmm. ask uh, specific questions. Now, in terms of um, support, um, again, where can um, people that have been affected by HIV turn to for um, sort of support and helping to, to deal with this disease? And that's a, that's a very good question as well. Um, I think uh, w one important way is uh, to be referred, obviously, to an HIV specialist. Mm -hmm. And uh, many HIV programs uh, in the country, including here in Alberta, do have access to um, support services through psychologists or psychiatrists. Um, so that's a very important uh, resource, and it's often a service that's available as urgently as is needed. Mm -hmm. um, and in addition to that, um, across the country there are a number of AIDS um, service organizations or community-based organizations um, that will help to offer support um, to people who are newly diagnosed with HIV as well. Okay, perfect. Great. Um, well, Dr. Singh, I'd like to thank you very much uh, for this um, informative um, rundown or, or overview um, of HIV. Um, I hope that our viewers have found it as um, helpful and informative as I have. Thank um, you. And so I'd like to thank you very much. You're welcome.